we acknowledge the first Australians as the traditional custodians of the continent, whose culture is the oldest living culture in human history. We pay our respects to elders, past, present and emerging, and we respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We extend our respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. They share the memories, traditions and hopes of the traditional ancestors with the new generation today and in the future. We would also like to thank them for looking after this land for thousands of years. Good afternoon everyone and welcome to our next program of Sea Week. So we've had an amazing week covering lots of different um, presenters from having the fabulous people from Reef HQ talk about an introduction to the Great Barrier Reef. Then we had a wonderful yarn with Arnie Kim um, at Sydney Olympic Park talking about mangroves and her uh, growing up with the ocean and her experiences living uh, sustainably with the oceans and the land. Then we explored uh, Oceans Plastics with National Maritime Museum and one of the programs that they have nearby looking at sea bins, a way of collecting some of the floating rubbish. Uh, following up from that yesterday, um, you came on a journey beneath the waves with me, looking at some of my scuba diving experiences and stories, looking at areas on um, the Sydney uh, Rocky Reefs, but also Great Barrier Reef as well. And today we're going to bring all of that knowledge together and do a bit of a quiz. So first of all, I've just got a couple of questions that I'll have a look at. Um, Dylan's asking and Anna's asking what the game pin is. I'll be sharing that with you shortly. I'm just going to do a bit of a recap of some of the things that we've covered over the last few days that might just give you a little bit of a helping hand along with our quiz. And this is especially important if you're joining us today and you haven't been um, in any of the other sessions during the week. Um, this is just some extra information of things that uh, might be a little bits of a, a reminder as well. So throughout the week, we've explored our different marine environments. So we've looked at a whole lot of different environments and thinking about how much of the earth is actually covered in our ocean and marine environment. So we're looking at a really large percent of that. I'm not going to give you the exact answer, but just thinking about the earth's surface and the oceans, how much of it is actually these marine environments, all the way from the rock pools, all the way down to the deepest ocean trenches that can get down to 11,000 metres deep and the variety of marine life. And quite a lot of that is found in our warm tropical waters. About a quarter of the diversity or variety of marine life is found in those warmer waters. But we do still have um, animals found all the way down to those deep sea trenches as well. And one of the things we talked about earlier in the week is that there's unfortunately even rubbish has been found down in some of these deep sea environments as well, which is a bit of a shame. So some of my favourite animals that we spoke about during um, the programs today that I absolutely love because um, they're really friendly and want to come visit you when you're going on a scuba dive are the cuttlefish. And you might remember why I like them so much. They've got a very special feature called chromatophores that allows them to change colour really, really quickly. So what we're going to do in just a moment is start our quiz and then we'll come back and finish up with some questions as well. So hopefully um, you'll have a lot of fun doing uh, the quiz. Now you've got a couple of options. If you are individual at home, you can either have the webinar still going and have a separate device for the Kahoot quiz. If you're in the classroom, you may have individual devices uh, for the students. Otherwise, you're going to have to vote on your answer quickly and get your teacher to select the right button. So two devices um, will work best. Um, but if you've got one, you can just switch over to the Kahoot um, and you'll be able to answer the questions in the Kahoot and still hear me talking about them as well. So the game pin while we cross over um, is going to be 176249. And I'll just share the Kahoot screen now so you'll be able to see that and see the pin. So you've got it up at the top of the screen there. 176249. So when you put that pin in kahoot.it, um, www.kahoot.it, 
kahoot.it it'll give you some options of selecting a name now it'll come automatically generate some animal names for you um so don't worry if it's not your favorite one um we'll have plenty coming through so we've got them coming in now so we'll wait a few more minutes to see whether we've got lots of individuals or lots of groups um, if your parents with your kids make sure you join as well see who's going to win the adults or the kids the same thing goes if you are in the classroom as well and you've got separate devices teachers see if you can um, be faster than your students so we'll see have those coming through in a moment uh, excellent okay we are going to get started. Just bear with me a moment. Oh, there we go. Okay, I think we're ready to start. If you come in a little bit later, that is fine. Don't want to have the music too loud. Okay, let's get our quiz started. Okay, our first question. What percentage of the Earth's surface is covered by ocean? Go to 10, 71%, One still to answer. Excellent. And it is 71%. I gave you a hint that it is most of that ocean, um, earth surface is covered by ocean. Remembering that it's from those shallow um, ocean environments, a high tide mark all the way down to the deep sea environments. Okay, let's see how we went. So lots of you got that one right, but it's who gets faster. So a uh, hero cheetah and diligent bat, you must have almost pressed that button at the same time. Let's move on to our next one. What is the largest ocean? The Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, Arctic Ocean, or the Indian Ocean? And yes, we've got the Pacific Ocean there. And the interesting thing is the Pacific Ocean is actually shrinking only by a few centimetres every year. So in a million years, it's probably not going to be the Pacific Ocean that is largest anymore. Let's see how everyone went. Oh, purple koala has jumped up. Must have been very quick on the button there. Well done. Let's move to our next question. What is the deepest part of the ocean? We mentioned that our oceans are all the way from those shallow uh, high tide marks all the way down to our deep part. Is it the abyss, the Mariana Trench, the Tongan Trench, or the Mid-Oceanic Ridge? And 100% right, everyone, it is the Mariana's Trench. And the deepest part of that is Challenger Deep. And up until 2019, only three people had gone down that deep. Since then, they've got a new submersible that's been going down and there's been more people. So it's up to something like 20 people have been down uh, that deep. But up until 2019, only three people had been down that far. Oh, Hero Cheetah must have been just quicker on the button that time and has just jumped back to the lead. We've got a true and false. Coral reefs contain 25% of all ocean species. True or false? And it is true. So the warm tropical waters um, and often shallower environments have a higher percentage. So 25% of all the ocean species. The remainder are found in other habitats around the world. Well, purple koalas jumped back on the top there. Well done, everyone. Our next question, how many species of marine turtle are there? We talked about in our first session on Monday, the 20, 10, 7. And we've got seven. 
And six of these marine turtles are found in the Australian waters. So we've got a really high percentage of those seven species are found here. So um, that's really amazing. And one of the reasons we need to be thinking about our turtle habitats and breeding grounds and how we can protect them for future generations. Well, not a big change there. Purple koala is still sitting at the top there. What is the largest fish in the world? A great white shark, a whale shark, a potato cod, or a sunfish? The picture is showing us that it is a whale shark. We got a, a pretty much across the board there with some of our answers. And the whale shark can get up to 12 metres in length. And some of them have been known to be almost 20 metres in size. So they're really large. And I have to say, it is on my list to go to Western Australia, uh, to Ningaloo Reef, to, to go and uh, dive or snorkel with the whale shark. So that is going to be one of my exciting things to do in the future. So let's have a look at how everyone went. Oh, a little bit of a change. Purple koala is on a streak with six in a row. Charming fox and red squid and diligent bat have made their way back up the table. So while we're thinking about sharks, how many species of sharks are there? Are there 100, 200, 300 or 400 species? Ooh, we've got a little bit of everything there. It is 400 species and it could be up to 500 species of sharks are found around the world. In Australian waters, it's about 180 species of shark. And a lot of people when I'm scuba diving ask me, um, you know, do I want to see sharks? Am I afraid of sharks? But most of the sharks that I see scuba diving are completely harmless. Things like wobbegongs and Port Jackson sharks or grey nurse sharks. So there are very few species of sharks that are considered dangerous to humans. And in Australia, it's probably things like the great white shark, tiger sharks and bull sharks. But most of the other species um, that we find across Australia are really amazing to see but aren't going to do us any harm let's see how we went there oh a little bit of a change we've still got purple koala sitting on the top there with a streak let's see if anyone else can knock purple koala off the leaderboard true or false mauna Kea is the largest mountain or the tallest mountain on earth true or false. bit of a trick question because it is actually true it is the tallest mountain if you go from the base to the peak whereas Mount Everest is the tallest mountain sort of on land above sea level so the Mount Akeo is 10,210 meters tall from the base to the peak whereas Mount Everest is only 8,800 and 49 from the base to the peak. So a little bit of a trick question there, but uh, it is really interesting to know that a lot of our tallest mountains are actually under the ocean. Some of them peak up to make our islands. This is one of the Hawaiian islands. Um, others are actually yet to break the surface, but are still very, very tall. But the tallest one on land is um, Mount Everest, but the tallest one on earth is this one here. Let's see how, whether we tricked anyone up there. No, still everyone going very well. Remember, trying to be the fastest as well. Even if you get the correct answer, someone might be faster. Let's have a look at our next question. Animal has the fastest color change. Well done, everyone. If you joined me in the session yesterday, I did talk about this and show some pictures of those chromatophores, those pores that help them change colours. And the octopus, squid and cuttlefish have the fastest colour change of any animals in the world, so much that they can almost pulse and flash. So by far, some of the coolest animals that are around. I absolutely love them. Um, and let's see how we did on the leaderboard there. Purple koala keeping the lead. Well done.
Okay. Our next question, which marine animal is the most venomous? Hearing octopus, stonefish, box jellyfish, or cone snails? Well, everyone jumped into that very, very quickly, and it is the box jellyfish. All of those animals that I put up on the screen, the blue ringed octopus, the stonefish and the cone snails are all venomous marine animals. But by far the most venomous is that box jellyfish. Oh, hero cheetah jumped up there. Must have been very quick making a comeback with three in a row. Let's see how we are going. We've still got five questions left to go. Which animal has the largest eye? Is it an elephant, blue whale, a colossal squid, or an ostrich? Oh, wow, you guys were so quick. And absolutely, most people got the colossal squid there. And the colossal squid's eyeball is just amazing. It's about the size of a soccer ball. So next time you're kicking a soccer ball or um, shooting a, a hoop with a netball or a basketball, just think it's around the same size as the colossal squid's eyeball. Let's see how we went there. <gasps> Purple koala is on an absolute streak. I think you're getting everyone correct. I should have made the questions harder. Okay, what's next? What do toothless whales use to filter out food out of sea? What do they use? Or do they have a separate strainer? And oh, so quick again, everyone. And it is baleen. And on that photo, you can actually see it in their mouth. So we've got two groups of whales. We've got tooth whales and toothless whales. And it very much will have an impact on what they're eating. So baleen, um, the toothless whales use baleen to filter out their food from their seawater. So they're really just gulping up as much as they can and then straining out the seawater. Whereas tooth whales are actually hunting and they're eating other foods. So thinking like sperm whales, one of the food that they eat are things like the colossal squid and the giant squid. Let's see how we went. Well done, everyone. Let's jump to our next question. How big is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch? Twice the size of Texas, the state of America, 1.6 million square kilometres, three times the size of France, or all of the above. So it is a bit of a trick. It is all of the above. All of those... Um, ones are different ways of describing how large the Pacific Garden um, garbage patch is. So it is absolutely huge and it's floating. There's actually sort of two of them are floating different currents in the Pacific Ocean. Um, and it is, you know, one of those things that shows how much waste is actually um, in our marine environments. Let's see how our list went. Red squid jumped up there and purple koala is unstoppable at the moment with a streak of 13 correct answers. So true or false, 20% of the marine pollution comes from land-based sources, which means comes from land. 20% of the pollution comes from the land. So we've got four saying true, three saying false, and it is actually false because it's 80% far greater number. So 80% of our marine pollution comes from sources on land. So different kinds of pollution, um, both sort of liquid, um, even sediment can be sometimes classified as a pollution once it flows into our oceans and things like all the rubbish and plastics and um, that are coming there as well. So it is a huge amount, 80%. I'm not quite sure what happened there. We skipped that leaderboard. What about last question? Can bacteria eat plastic? Wow, all of you are up on current science and research. And yes, there are some bacteria that they are using um, that can eat plastic. And they're looking at ways of how we can reduce the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and others by some of these bacteria. So they're also looking at big physical solutions we saw on Wednesday with um, the National Maritime Museum, that smaller scale collection of things like sea bins, but they are looking at bigger scale collections for things that are floating in the open ocean as well.
Let's see how we went. This is our final podium. So I think got Hero Cheetah has come up number three. Charming Fox, 13 out of 15. And Unstoppable Kirkamala has made it to the top of our leaderboard. So well done, everyone. I'm just going to stop sharing the screen there. Oh, I just need to turn it off in the background as well. Otherwise, we'll be listening. There we go. So well done, everyone. That was really impressive of uh, getting a lot of those answers uh, correct. Now, this is your chance to ask some questions about things that we talked about in the quiz or any of the topics that we've talked about this whole week during C Week. So please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A or the chat. AJ said they had a lot of fun with the quiz, so thank you very much. But any other questions that you have about uh, C Week, about our marine environments, about our presentations that we've had across uh, the week, or about any of the quiz questions. Was there something that was a surprise to you? There was something that you was a little bit unexpected. I know when I was doing my research, thinking about how deep and tall the marine mountains uh, were. If we think about some of the biggest mountain ranges are actually under the sea in the mid oceanic ridges. And of course, not only do some of our deepest places in the ocean are our trenches, there are lots of ocean trenches. So the Mariana Trench is certainly the deepest, but all around the Pacific, there are multiple trenches. So the second deepest um, or one of the other deepest is the Tongan Trench. And that is particularly deep as well. So not as deep as Challenger Deep, but not far off. Okay, let's check out our questions. What do you mean by the mountain being at sea level? Great question, Kylie. So if we think about what is above the sea level, so the particular mountain is part of the Hawaiian Islands. And we really think about those island chains being what we see above sea level or that high tide mark. But because they're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, they actually go all the way down to the ocean floor. And in the case of um, Mianakeu, it is something like, um, oh, I think it's like six to 8,000 metres is actually under the ocean. But when you count from the base all the way up, it does end up being taller than Mount Everest. It was a particularly interesting one. Um, how do fish eat water with the salt? Well, animals that live in marine environments are adapted to deal with the salt. So they're not usually sort of drinking the water the same way as that we would with fresh water. Um, they're usually either filtering it out or they can just cope with that salt. It is certainly a tricky one. If we think about there's lots of adaptations for um, especially plants. If we think about our mangroves that live on the coast, they use their roots to stop the salt getting into the plant. So some plants can be tolerant to salt environments and others need to be away from the salt. So plants like salt marsh and mangroves are really tolerant to that salty water environment. And in terms of fish, um, you know, they're not really sort of drinking the same way as we do in terms of our animals like mammals and, and reptiles. It's a great question. And I think I saw another one in the chat there. What is the shallowest ocean? Oh, that is a great one. So you'd be looking at some of the ones that are really, really salty. So you've got places like the Dead Sea um, that are not really, not as attached and they don't get water flow. They don't get flushed in and out. So they get very, very, very salty. And because they're shallow, um, they end up having um, more evaporation by the sun. So they end up becoming far more salty um, because they're very shallow. But we do have lots of shallow seas um, anywhere that the ground comes in and you get a high tide um, and it doesn't flush out all the time. We can get these areas and they tend to be warmer and they tend to be saltier. Uh, that's a great question as well. Um, are there some fish that don't break down when they die? Oh, it's a really interesting question. So you'd have something like... Um, if I can just, just excuse me while I just grab something. There we go. I didn't want to lean over the camera. So this was a great example here. Oh, 
you might be able to see if I hold it in front of me. This is a weedy sea dragon, okay? It's in the similar family to the seahorses. So they've kind of got quite a hard um, sort of, it's a little bit like an exoskeleton really. So it is their skeleton. And when they um, die, the color and all that pigment goes and it will be stinky as all of the living parts disappear. But once it's dried, you get left with that sort of shape of the animal. So in they would certainly be fish that don't really break down when they die. All the living components are gone, but you're left with the sort of the hard um, sort of skeleton almost. And that's quite common to see washed up on the shore after storms and those kinds of things. But in terms of the rest of the fish, um, they will, all of the living things would break down. So when we see things washed up on the shore, it could be something like this, or it could be a part of something. So it might be a swim bladder, which is inside a fish that helps them go up and down because it floats. It often pops out and we find those washed up on the shore. It could be parts of the skeleton, uh, sometimes whole fish skeleton, sometimes only parts of it. And they don't break down um, the same way. Um, they will eventually sink to the bottom of the ocean and break and break down. But sometimes we'll find them washed up onto the shore um, and those kinds of things. So anything with the hard parts will, can often remain. Um, even things like sort of the beaks of octopus can sometimes be found. The cuddle bone. Um, is a really good example of something from a cuttlefish that gets washed up on the shore that we find. And when I'll send some follow up as well about some of the beach combing things, because that gives you a really great insight into what is in your marine environments by what you see washed up on the shore. And often there are bits of fish that haven't broken down that um, end up there as well. Okay, how many sightings of colossal squids have there been? Oh, what a great question. And I don't know the answer to that. So what you would have had is a lot of the old myths of sea monsters and the kraken and those kinds of things are coming from giant squids and colossal squids. So there have been hundreds and thousands of sightings over the years. But in terms of them finding um, them washed up on the shore, that happens rarely. Several aquariums and museums around the world do have them now. Um, I know there's one in New Zealand in um, one of their museums and aquariums, quite a large one. And I think there's a video of like an autopsy that they did on it as well. Um, in terms of video footage, recently they did get video footage of, I think, the giant squid um, because they hadn't had any before. Um, a lot of these animals, they live quite deep in the ocean and they just hadn't been going down that far. Uh, other evidence they have from the colossal and giant squids were from the inside of sperm whales. So back in the day when they did whaling, um, often they would be little sucker marks on the side of the sperm whales and they didn't know what they were from. Sometimes there would be a bit of a battle between the squid and the sperm whale as they're still trying to catch it. Or when they were looking inside the stomach, they would find bits of tentacle or bits of squid. So in terms of how many sightings, not not a huge amount, um, but we do have uh, physical evidence and video evidence. And um, the more we've got cameras and photographs, the easier those are things to, to come around. So that's a great question. Thank you for that one. Uh, our next question is, uh, is it dangerous for humans and sea animals to swim in polluted water? Um, absolutely. And the, the, there'd be some things that are really similar in terms of how um, dangerous they are. Other things are going to be a little bit different. So for us, we're not going to see a plastic bag and think, oh, that's lunch, I'm going to eat it. Whereas an animal, especially things like turtles, would see a plastic bag and might think it's a jellyfish and then they eat it and then they can uh, either choke or too much plastic ends up in their stomach and it can't break down and there's no more room for food that would give them energy. The other part of it is things like oil and things that are floating in the water, like liquid pollutions. So some of those things would give us a rash. They could make us sick. If we accidentally swallowed some of the water with the pollution, it could give us a stomach bug um, and could make us very, very sick. So for smaller animals, it's a lot of what gets into the food chain. What they eat is coated in a pollution or is pollution itself. And then when a, when a bigger animal eats it, 
and bigger again, it gets into the food chain. They think that pretty much there are microplastics in almost every animal um, in the marine environment, in every part of the food chain. Um, so yeah, it is really dangerous to sort of be swimming in a polluted environment. And it certainly, even in Australia, um, when it's we've had lots of storms and there's been runoff from our land environments, remember 80% of the pollution is coming from those land-based um environments it's definitely not a good idea to swim um, just after there's been a lot of rain if you're living especially in very urban or city environments in sydney where i am based uh sometimes they'll too much water will overflow the sewage system and they'll have sewage actually going out in untreated sewage going out into the marine environments as well so definitely um, is something to be aware of for yourself to keep yourself safe but also for the safety of our marine animals so the best thing we can do is to stop that pollution getting in to the waterways in the first place and we all as individuals can do so much to help stop that picking up rubbish putting it in the bin, recycling it, reusing things uh, so it doesn't become waste in the first place, thinking about what you purchase and what you buy, um, whether or not you can reduce the amount of packaging and waste. If you're going to the beach, um, collect rubbish, take a spare bag with you. And if you see rubbish, if you're beach combing or exploring or swimming, and take that rubbish away with you. If you take even two or three pieces of rubbish that you didn't make, away from our beach and marine environments, you're really going to long-term help reduce the amount of rubbish that's out there. Um, so great questions there, Kylie, thank you. And I think I saw one about the largest crab. Let's have a little look over here. Um, how about, we've, we've done the colossal squids. What is the biggest animal in the ocean? Oh, well, I think they've worked out the biggest animal in the ocean is some sort of south kind of thing um, that's like a weird organism that's almost see-through that turns out to be metres and metres and metres and metres in length. But in general, the biggest animal that we think about in the ocean is the blue whale. Um, so even though we talked about whale sharks, it could get up to sort of 12 to 20 metres, the blue whale is over 30 metres in length. And that's considered the largest marine animal. And the biggest crab, I think, is the Japanese spider crab. And it's got, um, I think it's about three metres or so in size. So I might share a follow up with you all with um, a bit of a list of some of those big animals. Because it is quite interesting to see and compare what some of those are to each other and to how big we are as well. Uh, excellent. So we've got some time for a few more questions, everyone. I know it's a Friday afternoon um, and very happy if everyone wants to have an early mark. I was really impressed with how well and quickly you answered all of those questions. Um, I was trying to make it tricky, but uh, maybe I didn't make it quite hard enough. But it just goes to show that all of the information you've been learning all across Sea Week has given you so much extra information to think about the variety of life in our marine environments, but also also, different ways that we can consider protecting those environments as well. So thank you all very much. I'm going to wait a couple more minutes to see if there are some final questions. But if not, for those of you that need to head off, thank you very much for joining me again today. I will be sharing um, the recording in case you want to uh, double check some of your answers. Um, and uh, the playlist for all of the sessions that we've covered this week and a few extra information to help you continue um, exploring our amazing oceans uh, during Sea Week. Um, because it's not just a time to think about our marine environments during these particular weeks, but to think about it long term. Maybe research more about your favourite animals. Now, remembering my favourite marine animals are the, the cephalopods, the squids, cuttlefish and octopus. So they're my favorite ones that I love seeing, but you might love turtles, you might like sharks. So find out more about the marine life that lives closest to your coastline. Um, oh, and we've just got a couple of buys. Thank you all very much, everyone. I really appreciate you joining me for all of Sea Week. And on behalf of Virtual Excursions Australia, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye everyone. <laughs>